Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this evening's webinar. It's really great to have you with us. Um, thank you for spending your sunny Wednesday evening um, on Zoom with us. We really appreciate it. Um, those of you who have uh, come to Warm Welcome webinars before will know that we often uh, while we're waiting for people to join us, we often start by inviting people to put into the chat where they're from. Um, so uh, feel free to write into the chat um, where you're joining us from today. And we'll just give a few more minutes for everybody else to join us. Nice mix of geographical spread. A few people from joining us from libraries, from councils. Great to have you with us. Um, great. I think we we've got quite a lot of content for this evening's webinar. So I think let's get started and then um, and as more people join us, they can uh, join us wherever we've got to. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today um, from the real spread um, of people that we have across the country. Um, this is a, um, a very exciting webinar for us to, to get to do. Um, so we, if you've been to previous webinars, you'll know that we've covered um, topics, um, a real range of topics, how to create a welcoming space, how to fundraise for your space, how to be trauma informed. Um, and this is uh, today's webinar is all about how we continue to extend the welcome, how we continue as a as a welcoming space beyond winter. Um, we are recording this webinar and you will be able to find it on our after today on our um, website page that we have created um, specifically um, as a, a um, reference page for things that you can do um, as a space beyond winter. And so we'll share that link with you um, in the chat and we will also share that with you um, afterwards. Um, so I'll just pop that in the chat now. So this is where you can access uh, resources and you can access a recording of this webinar. Um, so we have with us uh, four speakers today from four different organizations that are all featured on, on that website page. Uh, we have with us uh, Liz Carnelli, who's going to share about places of welcome. We have uh, James Austin, who um, from the Joe Cox Foundation, who's going to share about the great get together, Jeremy Sharp from Linking Lives and Rob Stevenette from um, Transforming lives for good TLG. Um, so we're really grateful to have uh, them with us today uh, and I we're going to have a um, I'm going to pass over to our speakers we're going to have uh, them share for um, uh, a short period of time um, what uh, their offer is and how you can work with them uh, to continue uh, your warm space beyond the winter and then we'll have a section at the end for a Q&A. So you'll see that at the bottom of your, um, your your window, at the bottom of your Zoom window, there is a Q&A box. Please put any questions that you have in there and we will come back to them at the end of the session. Um, so I think that is everything from me. Um, Liz, I'm going to hand over to you to share about Places of Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much, Esther. Um, thanks for inviting us to be part of this. So I think it's fair to say that when Warm Welcome was set up, a lot of inspiration for that was taken from Places of Welcome. Places of Welcome started when in 2012, Birmingham held a social inclusion inquiry to think about what made Birmingham a welcoming city. And from that came the idea of Places of Welcome. 
And so from the very beginning, Place of Welcome have been different kinds of organisations who all want to provide an inclusive sense of belonging and welcome and connection for people. And so from the very beginning, they've been libraries and community centres, as well as churches and places of worship of other faiths, as well as um, community gardens. And we've even had one in a hospital and a prison. So they're all very different kinds of, of spaces. So I'm going to share a bit of my screen now and show you a bit about Place of Welcome. This is our website. So if you want to see it and go to it, it's www.placesofwelcome.org.uk. And I'm going to see if I can just share this video with you. Hopefully this will work. And you'll just get a bit of a flavour of Place of Welcome from this video. It's just a couple of minutes long, and then I'll say a bit more. Thank you. Places of Welcome are places where people come and connect with one another, places where people can find belonging, a place to be, and places where they can offer the gifts and skills that they're interested in. No Place of Welcome is the same as another because they are supposed to be relevant for the context in which they're in. The thing that holds them together are the values. So the first one is Place, an accessible, hospitable building that's open at the same time every week. The second one is People. Anybody can walk through the door and they'd be made to feel welcome. They'd be invited to join a, a conversation. And it's staffed by a group of local people that are essentially committed to making it happen. Presence, people make a choice to actively listen to one another. It's about engaging, it's about conversation, it's about listening. Provision, it can be as simple as tea and coffee and, and biscuits. But the essence of that is that it's free. The second bit of provision is a bit of local information. How do you help somebody new to this community navigate it? And the last one is participation. Everybody has gifts and skills and interests that they can share and they're encouraged to do that for the sake of the wider community. What we see is a change from isolation to becoming part of a community. People here on the estate live so close to each other but don't actually get to know each other until they're in an environment like this. We get different people come every week and it's just a great place for people to meet, make friends, relax and chat. It actually enables people to believe that they have something valuable. I've got to know such a lot of people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. It's really good to come to a place of sit around and have a little chat. And they help you. You know, when you're sitting and worrying you, you talk to you. You can just devote your time to speaking with other people, building relationships. You know, the people who here make you feel welcome. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think one of the reasons it's grown is because it's such a simple idea. You don't need lots of things to set it up. It's a place where community is built, where connection is made, and we want that to grow. Our well-being is better when we're part of communities. So if we can have more places of welcome across the country, then that's got to be better for the whole country and for the well-being of everybody. So that was our introductory video, and it talked about our values, which are here, place, people, presence, provision, and participation. And the ethos of Place of Welcome is really important. So the ethos is everybody's got something to bring, everybody's got something to offer. And this is about inclusion and connection. And it's about welcoming everybody and everybody feeling that they belong and can participate. So everybody that joins, it's free, but they have to agree to these values. So what do we offer if you want to join Places of Welcome? So we have this website and there's a map on it of all the Places of Welcome. We have a Dropbox. So anyone who joins has access to the Dropbox and the Dropbox has things in it like branding of Places of Welcome. If you want to use it, you don't have to, but you can. It's got things like posters and leaflets you can download and use. It's got things like risk assessments, safeguarding advice, things, activities that you might like to do in your place of welcome. And we also think that having a network, a national network, gives a kind of um, credibility to each place of welcome. So if you want to speak to your local doctor's surgery or the health visitor 
or you want to talk to the local library about having one, you can say, look, this is a national scheme. Here's the website. Go and see what it's all about. We offer free webinars every few months. We have one on something like volunteering or safeguarding or social prescribing. We have in some places an area coordinator who will give local places of welcome a bit of advice or encouragement or drop in or perhaps offer some local training. And I think as well, it's about sharing what we're all doing and encouraging one another. So when we meet together online, or whether people meet together locally as places of welcome, it gives that encouragement. I know where I live, which is a market town in Nottinghamshire, we've already got three places of welcome in the one small market town, which is really, really great. So to join us, all you need to do is go to the website and press on, I'd like to join the network, which I'll just show you where that is. Here we are, join the network, and you'll fill in a simple form that says, yes, I'd like to join, and these are a few details. And then we send you a longer form, which is all about how to, um, how to fulfill what we ask and a few sort of more details that we need from you, like what's the postcode of your venue and when will you be open every week? And we also have sometimes have people who query things like, well, you know, we, we want to be open, but not every week. Is that OK? And we can sort of qualify what people mean. So you can obviously ask us questions as well. In terms of what our impact is, well, this is valuable work because I think we all learned through the pandemic how vital connection is, how it's really important for our health and not just our mental health, but our overall well-being and resilience. We're much less likely to, you know, fall down the cracks of the sort of provision that's provided by the state if we've got people to help and support us. So my washing machine breaks, what do I do? Perhaps I ask my neighbor if I can use their washing machine till I get paid and I can get it mended. Connection is really important for everyday life, but it also makes us feel better about ourselves when we feel valued and when we feel included and when we feel that we belong. Our mental health, our physical health, is all improved by connection and belonging. And I think we all learned as well in the pandemic that we all need each other. We're not just isolated beings that, you know, can just get on alone. We all need to talk to one another and we all need to think about how we help and support each other. So if you would like to continue your warm welcome space year round, then perhaps it's something to think about whether you'd like to become a place of welcome. So you need to be open every week at the same time. You might want to close in school holidays, but other than that, you know, be open every week. Um, look at our values, see if you want to share in what we do. And it'd be great to have more warm welcome spaces joining Place of Welcome. And I'll just share with you um, a little story from a Place of Welcome. So a man was directed to our Place of Welcome and walking group by his GP because of his poor mental health. He soon became part of our Place of Welcome community and qualified as a very competent walk leader some months later. He leads walks often now, and it's great to see him so involved. Because a lot of our place of welcome have other activities like they also have debt advice, they also have quizzes, they also have a baby club, they might also um, do um, dance or singing or chip and fish and chip lunches, all kinds of things that they do. Um, but the main thing that they all need to be doing is be warm, welcoming places where people belong. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Liz. Um, I'm gonna hand over now to uh, Jeremy from Linking Lives, who's gonna share with us a bit more about what they have on offer. Great, thanks, Esther. So yeah, I'm Jeremy Sharp, uh, National Director of Linking Lives. Um, so um, we, we know from a lot of the feedback that has been coming out, um, from uh, Warm Welcome and other similar initiatives that there's often uh, not just an impact on uh, things like people being able to get out into a warm space, which has been really important during the winter, um, but particularly for uh, a real focus on people just feeling that sense of community 
um, being with each other and reductions in, in loneliness. And I know as part of the uh, evaluations and feedback from Warm Welcome in particular, um, some figures around 40% of people always uh, felt lonely before coming to the space. Um, and that's been 6% since they've started coming, which is a, a huge uh, reduction. Um, and also since coming to the space, the majority of the people, 60% attending the warm space, said they now never or rarely feel lonely. And that's um, that's our focus um, as Linking Lives. And it's great to have seen some of those um, statistics and uh, benefits really for uh, warm welcome spaces over, over the winter. Um, but it really underlines, and I think that's just, just really clear in terms of some, some of us attending today, underlines the need for uh, welcome spaces like this to continue throughout the rest of the year. It's not just something that's important uh, during the winter. And uh, that's what we do as a charity. We've been, we've, uh, we're operating on the basis of a model that started 25 years ago, um, which is a befriending scheme in Berkshire. Um, particularly focusing on addressing loneliness amongst uh, isolated older people. Um, we do that in a number of different ways, and it's, it's a way of really reaching out to those who are often on the margins of society and who don't have hardly any contact with, with anyone else from day to day or week to week. Um, one of our main focuses is, is on running befriending schemes. Um, so we've got a model that's worked well here in Berkshire uh, throughout that time. Um, and we've got the uh, just the processes, the th a lot of the things that uh, Liz was saying just now, some of the systems and uh, just to make it as easy as possible for local organisations to set up a befriending scheme within their local area. Um, for that project, we mainly work with uh, churches and faith groups, um, uh, but they then work on a more local level with all sorts of other agencies, such as uh, local authorities, uh, other charities within the local community okay. as well. Uh, we've got 60 of those running uh, around the country, and the focus is very much on volunteers uh, going and visiting someone once a week for around about an hour, or uh, after uh, COVID, we started telephone conversations as well. So again, that's an, another option that's available to, to those running local befriending schemes uh, through us. Um, there's also, we're working on a, what we call a light version of our befriending. So just something that's a little bit more simple and straightforward uh, that can be set up and run uh, on a local level. And we provide all the training um, and supply all, everything that's needed really to help get those uh, set up. And they're called uh, Two's Company. Uh, we also run a, a, a monthly webinar called Power of One. Uh, we've recognised recently that uh, there's, a, there's a real need and there's, there's a way that all of us can really make a difference in the lives of those around us uh, who are maybe struggling with loneliness. And uh, so we run a regular webinar called The Power of One that focuses on what each of us could do in different ways to come alongside and support those who we, we may come across in our day-to-day -day lives who may uh, be experiencing loneliness. Um, and the other one, which is, is probably the main one that is relevant to this group, um, is uh, called Good Conversations. We've started running in the last six months uh, a training session, which lasts for two hours, um, called Good Conversations. And that's really focused on how do we all, if we're in a setting um, such as uh, a warm welcome space, uh, or it could be a community cafe or drop-in centre, um, it, it provides training around uh, just just kind of upskilling volunteers in those settings. So it's things around um, uh, good listening skills, uh, boundaries, um, uh, safeguarding is another one as well. So the, the, some of the key things that are needed to to really uh, operate effectively in some of those local settings. Um, those are five pounds each um, for every volunteer, or if there's a, gr a large group. Um, whether it be a library or other organisation, then we can talk about specific uh, amounts for that. Um, I've got a short uh, film, um, just to mention, just before I do that, some of the outcomes for uh, the particularly our, our befriending side of things uh, are similar to what, to what Liz was saying, really, but um, around improving confidence, enabling people to get out and about a lot more than maybe they have been. Um, and it's been it's been really great to see, particularly the benefits as well for volunteers who get involved in a lot of these activities as they are able to to get mutual benefit from being involved as well. Um, I've got a film which I'll I'll just show, which goes into the um, good conversations 
uh, side of things, which I just mentioned, and is just a, th a quick three minute um, film. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this. We can't hear that well. Did you click share sound when you shared? The, the... Yes, uh, yeah, I did. Uh, just double check that. Try that again. No, it doesn't look like it's working. I can share it from here if that's. Could you, yeah, if you could. I won't If you are a volunteer in a welcome cafe, food bank, charity shop, library, church or any other community setting, you know that your visitors attend for a variety of reasons. Many come in for something practical such as food, a hot coffee or friendly advice. But whether they realise it or not, a significant number will be looking for company and someone to talk to. Social isolation is known to affect one in four people in the UK. Loneliness is an epidemic in 21st century society. Of course, we see people, we interact with people, but do we connect with people? Or do we consider inconsequential chatting to be a waste of time, a nice to have rather than an essential? For too many people in our society, the lack of this sense of connection with others is actually affecting their well-being and even their health. Recently, a multitude of warm and welcoming spaces have grown up to help with the cost of living. But many of the people visiting these places admit to being more attracted by their need for company and conversation. And even in food banks, charity shops and libraries, they are hearing the same thing. People are searching for someone to hear them, to value them, to affirm them. Whether you volunteer in any such project or just in your daily contact with others, you can make a difference. By having intentionally good conversations, you can help someone feel that they matter. But it can be hard to start such a conversation. Some people are easy to engage with, but others can be quite difficult. What do you talk about? How do you make it seem natural? This is what good conversations training from Linking Lives UK is all about. Whatever the setting, whether a cafe, a welcoming space, or just a casual encounter, we can all use extra skills, tips and techniques for hosting conversations that are intentionally beneficial. A recent participant in one of these training events said, thank you for this session. I feel much more confident about meeting new people in various situations. Another said, I really valued the part about how to guide a conversation. And one organizer of a project said, this proved very useful. We have now developed a much more comprehensive volunteer handbook. To find out how to access this training for yourself or your organisation, just visit www.linkinglives.uk and follow the links for good conversations. Great, thanks Esther. So yeah, I think that summarises really what uh, Good Conversations is all about. So yeah, be, do feel free to go to our website, which you saw there, um, for any information about Good Conversations or any of the other aspects of our work. We also have a conference between the 16th and 17th of May, if I can give a quick plug for that, uh, which is online and there's information on our website as well. Great, thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, I am now going to hand over to James from the Joe Cox Foundation. Um, and just a reminder, 
um, that there will be a bit of time for a Q&A. So if you have any questions for any of our speakers, do put those into the question and answer box. Um, over to you, James. Brilliant. Oh, always good to unmute yourself at the start. Um, brilliant. Thank you for passing over. It's really lovely to hear about some of the things that Places of Welcome and Linking Lives are doing. I just wanted to quickly speak to you a little bit about the great get together and hopefully everyone here can uh, see the slides and I'm not just sort of randomly talking over what um, is just sort of the Microsoft PowerPoint bit. So hopefully that's all good. Um, but the great get together is a campaign which we run as the Joe Cox Foundation. Um, and really at the centre of our campaign is Joe's key message, which was that we have more in common than that which divides us. So it's a campaign we run every year um, very much on the basis that we want to try and bring to life Joe's message that we have more in common and really face national celebration or a national festival um, of commonality, if that makes sense. And at the heart of it lies Joe, and I won't go over it too much because I'm sure most people on the call know who Joe was and sort of uh, her story, but she was someone who was a passionate campaigner, a passionate activist, um, who devoted her life really to the belief that people, that a more kinder, fairer, more tolerant world was possible, and particular to a belief that we have more in common, that which divides us. And unfortunately, that belief led to seven years ago her being murdered. Uh, she was on her way to a constituency surgery. And out of this came a huge outpouring emotion. I'm sure many people here will remember that, um, which included the setting up of a great get together um, as sort of an annual campaign, which really to try and reject some of the hate and division that led to a murder and also to really celebrate what we have in common. We're now into the seventh year of a great get together. The first one was uh, bigger than a jubilee and we still have millions of people participating every year in it so it's a really fantastic a bit of a privilege to be able to sort of um i run the campaign as a campaign manager to run it it's something i'm very very passionate about um and great get togethers i think the key thing is they can be anything what we want to do they can be a walk they can be a festival they can be food sharing they can be a cup of tea with your neighbors um we just encourage you to do anything that's positive and brings people together and really sort of brings to life that message that we have more in common um on the weekend um and this weekend will be the 23rd to the 25th of june but we do accept events throughout pretty much throughout the year um i think the first event we had was the grand iftar in Southwark cathedral um a couple of weeks ago and then our last one was last year was some of the visit my mosque events um in september so we do accept events through the year and in our experience the ones that have the most effective have the biggest impact are often the smallest they are those cups of teas with neighbors they're those small connections um, so if you would like to run a great get together, whatever you want to do is very, very welcome, no matter how big, how small, it doesn't have to be a big festival or street party. Um, we also run as a campaign to sort of explain a little bit of why I'm here, I guess, how we link with warm welcome, the great winter get together every year, which is run between 16th and 30th of January, or was run between 16th and 30th of January this year, it's always in the last two weeks of January, which is loneliness focused. Joe was one of the first MPs to really focus on loneliness. Um, and we very much encourage people to create places of collection places that people can reach out and connect with what is the loneliest time of year. And we were really help, fortunate to be able to work with Warm, warm Welcome this year um, to be able to try and encourage many Warm Welcome spaces to become places of connection and places. Of, and we know that was one of the things that really came out of their impact report. Um, and we were very, very fortunate. We had over a thousand different organisations take part in the great win to get together this year. Um, and we wanted to keep linking in with you all because it's all such fantastic work that you do all year round. And we want to try and see if we include that in the great get together. Um, to give you an idea of a few of the events we've had before. So we had, for example, last year, we had the great, a great walk together, which was run by Muslim hikers, bringing together refugees and local people to explore Coventry's green spaces. We had a great, a great ride together with Batley Libraries coming together with Batley Poets and give a few words, uh, which is a fantastic charity that sends positive messages, encourages people to write letters, uh, positive letters which are sent to socially isolated people. Uh, we had coffee mornings, um, and we had a fantastic thing in Cardiff Church, which was around Day of a Soup where lot, bringing together lots of community organisations to share different soups and food sharing and all that side of things. Um, and each of those very different events, but have that same spirit of positivity and commonality in them to really try and bring people from different backgrounds together. And we know it has an impact. So we strongly believe um, that having those sort of one-off events that sort of give you something, give you an activation point, a chance to reach out, um, they lead to they, they can lead to longer lasting impacts. It's not just one good day, people come back, they stay involved, they build new connections, they build new friendships, and it brings a community together in, in a way that maybe sort of just doing something every week, which is the same each week and doesn't have that sort of activation point to get people in, doesn't. So we found, for example, that 71% of those who come to a great get together say we feel lo less lonely after it. We found community groups, by getting increase in volunteers and participants after a great get together. 
um, and that people feel more connected to their neighbours. So running one does have broader benefits beyond just being a really good day to really show that you agree with the concept that we have more in common and want to do that. Um, so what's happening this year? So this year, the main weekend is between 23rd to 25th of June. So as I say, we do welcome stuff throughout. Um, we have over 40 different partners, including, I saw someone mention Camarados and their fantastic public living rooms are very much involved with what we're doing. Uh, we're running, um, we've got Royal British Legion involved, we've got Good Gym, we've got a fantastic walking charity called Slow Ways. There's a whole range of different organisations that are sort of coming because they really believe in the same cause as us. Um, and we are running three specific initiatives which have uh, support documents and support information um, that are specific to those initiatives, uh, which you might want to take part of. So we have a great walk together, which we run with Refugee Week. We're fortunately part of something called the Month of Community because every community organisation on Earth seems to do their sort of awareness month in June. So we've all banded together to try and work together on trying to uh, cross pollinate as much as possible. So we're running a great walk together with Refugee Week, which runs between the 19th, 18th and 20th fifth this year, if I remember rightly. Um, so we encourage people to walk together, either with refugees or in solidarity with refugees, or just to connect. We're running a great wa watch together with Cinema for All, um, which is really celebrating that ability of film to connect us and it being sort of watching film TV is obviously one of those things that unites us as a nation. We talk about those water cooler moments. We talk about, about those chances where, you know, we all sat down and watching the same thing, whether that be the coronation in a few weeks, or whether it be a particular film or, or sports event. Um, and we've got the great, re what's slightly awkwardly named, Great Read slash Write Together, um, which has been run with various libraries, charities, sort of reading agency, libraries connected, the Community Libraries Network. Um, to encourage if you're a library or a reading group or that sort of space, community centre that sort of got books and wants to try and encourage people to connect around reading and writing, um, we have a whole load of resources out there to try and support you with doing that. And we'd love you to take part as well. Um, and so how can you get involved? Well, Whatever you're running, whether it's a special event or just something that you run every week and you just like to get involved, a great get together to show you sort of support it and maybe reach out a little bit more. Um, you just need to register it on our website. That's the first and foremost thing. Go to greatgettogether.org slash register and then shout about it on social media is the other side of things. So, you know, mention you're part of a campaign. We can try and support. We can try and push that forward. Um, and if you want to do something a little bit bigger or you want to link up with a different charity, um, do just get in touch with us as well. We're always here sort of to support the campaign. And if there's any sort of support or advice you need, we're very, very happy to help out um, and maybe try and give stuff a little bit more profile as well if you sort of that's the area you want to go into. So it's a very loose touch, easy campaign to be involved with. But if you want to do a bit more with them, there's lots of opportunities to do so as well. Uh, I'll put all these links and information in the chat in a moment. But if you do have any questions or issues or you'd like to be involved, uh, drop me an email, have a look on the website and uh, I'm very happy to answer questions later as well. Um, I'll stop sharing. Great. Thank you so much, James. Um, uh, all of the, the links to the various websites so from the organisations that are sharing today are all on um, that warm welcome website. Um, so you can find more information there. Um, finally, we're going to come to Rob this evening uh, from TLG. Over to you, Rob. Thank you, Esther. Hey everyone, great to be here today. Um, at TLG, we've loved being a part of the Warm Welcome campaign, and it's just been such an encouraging um, sense of unity, of collaboration, spaces of all sorts of shapes and sizes, um, connecting with, um, with people across the UK. It's been brilliant um, to see. Um, in thinking about what it looks like to be a warm welcome all year round, I thought I would do something that feels very much a 2023 thing um, and ask ChatGPT. Um, so what does it look like for a community space to be a warm welcome all year round? And, and this is what artificial intelligence had to say. So to give you a bit of a paraphrase, um, a space should focus on hospitality. It should greet everyone warmly. It should be inclusive. It should build relationship. It should provide opportunity for people coming along to, to serve in time. It should communicate regularly and it should foster a culture of kindness. And I know that, that all of these aspects in all sorts of different ways will have been reflected in 
and spaces and warm spaces across the UK as part of Warm Welcome. And, and it's something that um, I really believe we see in, um, in our make lunch um, spaces across the UK as part of TLG. To tell you a little bit more, TLG stands for Transforming Lives for Good. And we are a charity that partners with, with churches um, all over the UK. And we want to help churches to bring a hope and a future to children and families that are, are struggling. And Make Lunch provides a space for children and families, predominantly in the school holidays, but also in the term time as well through different connection points. And it's about opening the space in hospitality, providing um, activities, lots of fun, full of joy, um, but and also sharing a warm, nutritious meal as well. And food insecurity across the UK, as, as we'll all be aware, is is a huge need, is a need that is all year round. Um, some recent research from the Food Foundation um, showed this, that 27% of households with a child under the age of four experienced food insecurity in January 2023. And, and that was 23% for households with um, school-aged children. So it is a huge, huge need. And of course, another need that is all year round as well um, is a need that's been shared a lot about already today really well around um, isolation and connection. And that's something we're really passionate about with Make Lunch is the opportunity it is to build relationship, to, to say to children and families, you are, you are welcome, we see you. And, um, and yeah, it's, a, it's an open door for connection. Over the UK, we have a network of 100 churches um, who are um, running Make Lunch Clubs, um, serving hot food, um, providing um, th those, these spaces, nourishing rich friendships during the school holidays. It's a programme that's been running for over um, 10 years. And at TLG, we provide a model of training and resource and support that really helps you develop what you're doing and, and grow really sustainably. Um, for non-church spaces, there's lots of opportunities to support and collaborate, whether that is in, in perhaps venues and sharing resources, um, make lunch clubs work across the local community, accessing different um, food sources. Um, so that could potentially be a way. Also volunteering as well um, as um, yeah, make lunch clubs connect with with all sorts of different volunteer networks, um, which could be a, um, a huge um, source of, of help. I wanted to share with you a story from a, a recent um, film that we did in um, of one of our Make Lunch partners up north. I'll put the, um, the link into, into the chat so you can read it um, in more detail and watch it should you, should you like. Um, this is from um, from a mum uh, who's coming along to a Make Lunch Club. Um, and she says this, that, that Make Lunch has lifted a massive burden. I love that there's a community here that just give to people. They don't necessarily want a single thing back. It's absolutely amazing. And from her son, Joe's in primary school, he said this, I feel happier now that I can come to Make Lunch. My mum and dad don't have to worry about looking after us. What we're going to do, they don't need to run after us. They do feel less worried now. And that sense of connection brings freedom in all sorts of different ways. It's that sharing of joys, those relationships are built across, across the year. Um, and these lunch clubs will be running across half terms, lots of run over the Easter holidays, and we'll be planning ahead for, for the summer term. Um, as as well to show with you um, some um, impact numbers. So far, we've seen well over 200 sessions run across the UK so far in in quarter one, and that's reached um, over 3,000 children and families, and will be increasing a lot over each um, holiday um, cycle. Um, so, if you'd like to find out more, it all starts with a conversation wherever you um, wherever you're based. I'll put the link into, into the chat, which will take you through to the Make Lunch page of our website. You can download a brochure there. And also, if you'd like to, to chat further, 
there's an inquiry link and yeah we'd love to to get in touch over the um yeah over the coming days and yeah to see how we can help but feel free as well to bring any questions that you have thank you so much great thank you rob um there we go i've just removed the spotlight so we now have hopefully all of our speakers uh can be seen um Thank you so much to um, all of you who have shared. Um, I hope that has given uh, everyone lots of food for thought as to the kinds of things that you could be doing um, beyond the winter. Um, please do uh, put any questions that you have into the question box now. Um, we've got a little bit of time uh, to answer any questions that you have. Um, I know that we've had uh, a couple of questions through. Um, Kate has asked, um, how do you make contact with those who are most isolated? Um, many of them are invisible. Um, Liz has popped some suggestions um, in, a, in a response um, to Kate in the chat box, but um, I wondered if uh, Jeremy or in maybe like James as well, from your experience in the the work that you do have there been particular things that have enabled you to make contact with um, those who are most isolated yeah i'd say for us um it's similar to liz really so um, we get referrals for local befriending schemes from uh, social prescribers social workers gps often self-referrals as well so maybe family members who are concerned about um either an elderly um yeah, so, so maybe a mother or father um, who they feel could really benefit from a regular visit or phone call. So it's really through those uh, often statutory links or charities um, or, or individuals that, that know of someone. And that's that's often the key way of engaging with those who otherwise might be quite, as you say, invisible and uh, not really recognised or noticed by the rest of, of society. And they're the key ones, I think, that we feel that we're able and wanting to reach out to because they you know they don't have often any links and aren't often able to go out either so uh, yes yeah, it's, it's really important to be able to go out uh, to them so as a um sorry just to clarify um as a, as, as a warm space if you are wanting to reach out to lonely and isolated people would your advice be to kind of build relationships with uh faith groups and gp surgeries and other services in your local area yeah definitely i think um obviously by definition a lot of the warm spaces would be uh having people attend that, that will have heard of it and they're able to physically get out of their own home but um yeah to be, if you're wanting to reach some of those who um would like to to you know to, to have contact with someone else but but just can't get out then yeah then often those statutory bodies and other charities would would be the ones who'd who'd uh, be in touch and be able to put you in touch great thank you um james so i noticed you want to come in yeah it was just to say it is obviously very hard to find people who are you know traditionally hard to reach is why you know we use the term um but they, i think a lot of the advice and jeremy have given is really important particularly the analog side of things i think a lot of the time now we automatically go to social media and we go digital and i've even had to run workshops recently about how to do leaflets and that side of things because people have gone that far the other way in some ways they know how to do social ads but they don't always know how to reach and it's remembering a lot of people are still digitally excluded or aren't as online as everyone else uh, the other side of things i'd say is really try and have a think about who you're trying to target and who you want to try and reach and what might attract them i think a lot of the time and I was having a discussion the other day with a local trust and a uh, faith group the other day in Birkenhead about this. We often try and do stuff that appeals to us and maybe doesn't appeal to the group that we particularly want to reach out to. So, for example, the space we're using might not be appropriate. So the local trust group I was talking had one on the edge of an estate and we're finding no one from the estate was going there, basically because it was up a really big hill. And when they moved themselves to a slightly better community space or slightly smaller and it wasn't there, they had to pay a little bit, to be fair. Um, they suddenly got people from different backgrounds coming in because it was convenient and appropriate. So being aware, people generally don't travel more than about, we talk about 15 minute cities, five to 10 minutes to get to some space. So that's a really important part of it. Yeah. And if you can try and partner up and try and co-produce. So try and think, is there someone from that background who you can talk to? Is there a church? Is there 
a faith group is there a mosque is there someone who's already working with them can you go to them and say what works what are we doing wrong here um, and how do we tailor what we do because uh, often the analog stuff's really good but if we, there's sometimes a barrier that's there that we just don't know about um, and when you talk to someone it's really really obvious um, but you I've certainly worked in community initiatives where I've been desperately trying to get in touch with people and trying to get them involved and then found it's something I just haven't considered was a barrier is a barrier so it's always just worth keep thinking I think Can I just add in, is that all right, Esther, that I think, you know, we've, we've got to think about everybody um, needs connection. So, you know, it's not just, you know, your typical thing you might think of is somebody who's 85, who's housebound, but asylum seekers, people who've lost their jobs, a new mum, somebody who's been really new, moved to a new area somebody who's struggling with agoraphobia, it's not just you, it's sort of the person you might think of. And lots of surveys have found that young people are actually the most people suffering from loneliness. So, you know, don't make assumptions. And I think we all need connection. We all need to belong. And the best thing to do is invite people because actually it's really hard to go some something by yourself the first time you don't know a soul. Talk to people. Talk to people in your neighborhood. Go and talk to people. You you know, do you, have you ever knocked on the door of your people on your street? Have you ever said to them, you know, I wonder if you'd be interested. We do this thing every Friday at two o'clock. Would you maybe you'd like me to call for you? Because that's going to be a lot better than sort of sticking even sticking a leaflet through. So just be creative and and make connections with people in communities. That's what I would try and say. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's really helpful. And, and I hope that even the warm welcome map is a good start to get to know other organisations that are near to you um, who might have, have different connections into the, the community. Um, we've also got a question um, just about uh, can libraries connect with other libraries who are taking, who are involved in the great read and write together? And James has said, yes, definitely get in touch with him and he will let you know who else is um, doing stuff that you can connect with. Um, there's also a question about what is a, a public living room, which is mentioned. And I know that, um, sorry, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know there's someone from Camarados who's with us. So I don't know if, uh, oh no, do you know what? I was just gonna ask you to speak, but I don't think I can because this is a webinar. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, so sad. You're just being stuck in the chat box. Um, but <laughs> hello, it's very lovely to have you with us. Um uh one of the um key things that camaradas do are facilitate um oh great. We're gonna have some we're gonna have some um questions that we <laughs> some uh text that we can read. Um yeah, I mean I I guess if there's anything from the camaradas team that you would like to uh share or let people know about what we're doing i know that one of the key um elements of what camaradas do is facilitate public living rooms where anyone can come and spend time together and connect um and there there's a link to what they're doing and to their website and how you can get involved on our um uh on our warm welcome website um so yeah, you can find out more information about them there. There's also a video. There you go. Um, so you can copy and paste that and uh, save that for later. Um, there is also a question here on, does it have to be, James's three groups, we straddle and go beyond a couple of them. I'm not quite sure what the three, what James's three groups are. James, um, do you know what your groups are? I think it's maybe the three initiatives we're running with the Great Wall together, Ride Together and the other one, Watch Together, that's it. Um, and the answer is absolutely no, they're just, they're things we partner with charities run particularly, uh, but just because, you know, we've got some crossover or whatever, um, but that absolutely whatever you want to do if it's positive and it brings people together we would really welcome it as part of a great get together 
this year. So it doesn't have to be part of Vogue's free. If you want to tie it in and they give you an idea and you'd like to be to do a film screening, that's absolutely brilliant. If you just want to have if you want to have people for a cup of tea, that's also brilliant. Um, and if you want to run a giant festival with 10,000 people, you can also do that. But I wouldn't advise it. Um, so whatever you want to do. So, yeah, absolutely. Please do just um, whatever you fancy. Provided it's positive, provided it brings people together. We absolutely welcome it as part of a great get together. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, what would be your biggest tip for spreading the word that your space is open to all and not just the elderly? We want to encourage everyone um, and uh, because everyone needs these spaces. Anyone like to clip in on that? I think timing is quite important. So, um, for example, if you're running one, I know there's one, I know a place of welcome that runs an after school event. So it's encouraging anyone to come, but particularly welcoming people who are coming back from school, having picked kids up. So obviously they've advertised it in the school and outside the school and to people going in and out and people passing can come in. Um, so that, you know, you're more likely to get people who can go at that time from that audience, as it were. And if you are having it, you know, 10 o'clock on a, on a Friday, you're more likely to get people who are not working. Similarly, if you run it on a Friday evening with fish and chips or something, you might, might or get all, you know, all kinds of people. I was speaking to someone today who runs something and it's connected to several different things that they run. So they run a youth thing, they run a, a refugee and asylum project, and they run something for older people and they all come together at this place of welcome. So I think it depends about what your connections are and who you're working with in order to, you know, in terms of making it accessible for, for people. Great, thank you. Um, would anyone else like to? Okay, that's fine. Um, if uh, I'm going to assume that we don't have any more questions, um, uh, but I am going to just share. Um, a few final details with you all. Um, so uh, as uh, we shared and mentioned earlier, you can find all the inf all the information about um, what's been uh, shared uh, today on our warm welcome website. Um, uh, so please feel free to go on there. We'll also upload the webinar so that you can um uh you can access that um in addition if you are a church organization um if, if, if you're a church then we have coming up on the 18th of may uh, a well-being conference and the purpose of this is for churches who are interested in responding to the mental health crisis who want to do something for that need in their community but I'm maybe not quite sure where to start or how to do that effectively. Um, this conference, uh, our, our aim um, with this space is to provide some clarity of direction and some next steps and to share resources and training and opportunities that are out there to support you. Um, so you would be very welcome um, to come and join us. It's going to be at Westminster Chapel um, on uh, the 18th of May. And uh, I'm going to pop a link into the chat now. Um, this website is where you can find all the information on that. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists who have joined us. Um, and thank you so much for your generosity in sharing your time and the resources that you have. Um, we, uh, yeah, we um, will continue to send out our warm welcome newsletters. So um, you'll be sent, if you haven't kind of managed to catch it, we, you will be sent the um, warm welcome website link again. And the, for those of you who are registered as churches, you will get the Church Works for Wellbeing. Um, 
So thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much for being part of One Welcome and um, for everything that you've done for your communities over the last six months or so. Thank you so much and have a good evening. <laughs>